So as you can see, our guest speaker today is uh, Professor John Kangsen. She's a professor of education at George Mason University, and she's also the director of Mason's Global Online Teacher Education Center. Dr. Sheen specializes in teaching English as an additional language to young learners and teenagers as well. And she has provided both in-person and online professional development programs and workshops to English language teachers from over 100 countries around the world. And, and we are one country in that 100 country, right? And in 2021, she was named one of the top third. 30 English language specialists by the U.S. Department of State in recognition of her lasting impact on the specialist program in the field of TESO as well. And she's also an award-winning author and the series editors of the National Geographic Learning. Her titles include Teaching Young Learners English, Breaking Through the Screen, Our World, Welcome to Our World, and Impact. Some of you may know about that titles, right? And the most recently, um, she co-authored the book for the TESO Press called The Six Principles for Exemplary uh, <clears throat> Teaching of English Learners, Young Learners in a Multilingual World. So let's give it up to our speaker today. Hello, can you hear me and see me? Hi. Well, thank you so much for that lovely welcome. I so appreciate uh, being invited by Viet TESOL and the Regional English Language Office in Vietnam. It is my pleasure to present to you today. And the topic is, of course, my very favorite topic, teaching English to young learners. And I think it is so exciting that there is this VMOOC that has been offered and with these sessions like this. So as I understand, this is the fifth session and I'm excited to be the speaker and to share ideas about it. So I'm going to share my screen now and get started with the presentation. Are you guys ready? Yes. Yay, very good. So the topic is practical activities to teach young learners. And I'm hoping that throughout this presentation, we will be able to have some participation through the chat box. And so I might ask you some questions and I hope to hear from you there. Okay, so to get started, I want to start out with this quote because it's always important if you're a teacher of young learners to keep this in mind, that if a child can't learn the way we teach, maybe we should teach the way they learn. And if you're a teacher of young learners, you know that young learners have special characteristics and that we might be using a kind of activity and you realize that students not only are maybe bored or they don't understand, but it may make them not engaged with you in the classroom. So we have to really think about how children learn. And in terms of learning a foreign language, we know from Lynn Cameron, children see the foreign language from the inside and try to find meaning in how the language is used in action, right? Because they're active learners and thinkers. In interaction, because they're social learners. And with intention, meaning there has to be some intention, some purpose for using the language. Rather than from the outside as a system and form. And, and from the outside as a system and form. This is where my, maybe talking about the grammar rules, which may not mean so much when you have very young learners. So instead of approaching the teaching of language from the outside, from these grammatical rules, let's think about how to approach teaching language from the inside in action, 
in interaction, and with intention. We know that children learn by doing and learn through interaction with one another. And so that's why it's so important to be able to change our approaches to the way our young learners learn. So this comes from one of my new books. Uh, it just gives the basics about how young English learners will learn better. Okay, they will learn better if you engage them in hands-on multisensory activities, if you maintain children's interest and attention, if you tap into children's sense of fun, relate learning to children and their lives, encourage children to work with peers, and you got to make sure you build children up. Don't bring them down. We have to encourage them in this process of learning and so that they will engage with us and engage more successfully. So with that in mind, I want to start by looking at some very practical activities as the title of my presentation indicated. And the first thing it's so important to do to support the learning with children is to establish routines. But I want to encourage you to establish routines that will really help you connect with your learners and encourage them to use more language. So let's start with a great routine, which is something you can use to start out every class to greet them. So this is a hello song that I have in, in my series, Welcome to Our World, and I'll teach it to you. Okay, so first listen, and it goes like this. Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? Hello, hello, how are you? I'm very good. Yeah, I'm very good. Yeah. Thank you very much and you. All right. Now I want you to sing along with me. Now, even though you are out there and you're on mute, I'm going to imagine that I can hear you singing along with me. Let's go. Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? Hello, hello, how are you? I'm very good. Yeah, I'm very good. Yeah. Thank you very much and you. Did you like my hello song? Let me know in the chat. And thank you for the kind comments already. All right, now, this is a pretty easy song to use. And also, you can encourage your students to express how they feel, right? We're asking, how are you? So start each class asking your students, how are you? Okay, we've gone through some tough times through the pandemic, and we're still on the back end of it. And so there's a lot of stress and a lot of uncertainty. So it's very important to ask our children, how are you? Now, you could use something like this feel wheel. And maybe you just start out with, are you in the green zone or the blue zone? or the yellow zone, or the red zone. So take a look at the words there, right? And tell me, are you in the green zone, blue zone, yellow zone, or red zone today? You tell me. And I'm going to take a look in the chat and see. Ah, I see green zone, green zone, green zone. Excellent. Well, I feel like I'm in the green zone today because I'm feeling pretty happy and I'm also feeling I'm pretty focused on this presentation here together. Now, maybe your students aren't always in the green zone, right? Maybe they're feeling a little bit tired or maybe they're feeling a little bit sad. Maybe they're in the yellow zone and a little bit worried. You could even switch back to the song. And when you ask them how they are, they can sing their own verse to the song. Okay, so let's take a look back at the song. And of course, it starts like this with the question. Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? Hello, hello, how are you? 
Well, maybe if a student feels worried, they might say, I'm very worried. Oh, I'm very worried. Oh, thank you very much. And you, okay. So you might want to put the emotions there and let them express it. Maybe they seem very tired. They could sing, I'm very tired. Yawn. I'm very tired. Yawn. Thank you very much. And you, all right. So. Routine, hello song, ask students how they are. Now, sometimes you can expand the vocabulary and use those words. That way students aren't using the same word every day. I'm very good. I'm very good. They can be more descriptive. You could even connect it to an object, right? So maybe I have, um, you know, my, my little turtle. Right. And I could say, Oh, I feel lonely. So I want to keep my turtle with me. All right. So you could talk about an object or even a picture to describe how you feel. Okay. This is a way to connect with your learners and see how they are. Now, maybe your learners don't know a lot of English yet, but they can connect with some emojis and you can help expand their use of English. You could also check in with them with the routine, a circle time routine, where you could either sit in a circle, stand in a circle, and ask them how they are and get to know them a little bit better. So here, right, you can even have the wheel, right? So I put the wheel with the arrow and I could change it and students can point to how they feel Okay, because it might be a little difficult for them to use the language and then you can support their feelings and talk about it. Circle time can also be another great time to connect with your students. Okay, it can be a routine to understand others and build trust. Okay, and maybe you have a gratitude circle at the end of class and you ask them, oh, who do you want to thank today? Okay, so this kid is saying, Leo, thank you for giving me a marker. Okay, they can express thanks. This builds that social emotional learning as well. Um, and then maybe you can do a little appreciation chant for Leo who was letting other students borrow his markers and just say a quick two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate? Leo, Leo. Yay, Leo. Okay, so a way to give appreciation, expand the use of English, practice using numbers. There's lots you can do with these routines that build English, but also connect to learners and build them up. All right. Has anyone used a gratitude circle before? And if you have, I hope you will continue to do so. And if you haven't, try it. Okay, now another routine. It's great to always end your session or your class with encouragement. And so you can do a simple chant like this. You were wonderful. You were great. See you next class and don't be late. Okay, so why don't you try it with me? Say it out loud. You were wonderful. You were great. See you next class and don't be late. You can use it as routine and then tell them, turn to the person next to you and tell your partner. You were wonderful. You were great. See you next class and don't be late. When you have students turn to each other, to say it to each other, you build that social interaction in class and make the use of the language more authentic. All right. And finally, another one. If you wanted to start with a hello song, you can end with a goodbye song for your very young learners. This one goes to a very simple tune. Take a listen. Goodbye, it's time to go. Time to go, time to go, goodbye, it's time to go, see you later. How about you sing it along with me? 
<clears throat> Get your singing voices on. Here we go. Goodbye, it's time to go. Time to go. Time to go. Goodbye, it's time to go. See you later. All right. Which one did you like better? The hello song or the goodbye song? You can let me know in the chat box. All right. So here we go. Let's keep going with a few routines. Now, something that is so important when you're working with young learners is that you have to be aware of how they're feeling in class and you need to know when your learners need a break. Maybe they're working on an activity really hard and they're looking a little tired. Maybe this was stress when they're looking a little stressed or maybe they're looking a little bit unhappy about it. Well, sometimes you just have to stop and take a little break. And so here are some ideas for brain breaks. So brain breaks, of course, it's exactly as it sounds. You're going to give your young learners a break. You might give them a chance to stretch. You might give them a chance to just breathe deeply if they're getting stressed and they need to calm down. And you might give them a chance to think about something fun. Now, these brain breaks can also be a good opportunity for TPR, total physical response, because you're going to tell them to do some things with their bodies and they will respond physically. Let's take a look at some examples. So you could take a brain break and just do the shake shakes. So if you were doing a writing activity with, with your young learners, sometimes they really hold the pencil or pen really tight because they're trying so hard and they might need to shake it out before the next activity. Okay, so you'll just shake one hand. So everybody shake your right hand. One, two, three. Now shake your left hand. One, two, three. Shake your right hand. One, two, three. Shake your left hand. One, two, three. Shake both hands. One, two, three. Okay, so that's the shake shakes. You can shake the foot. You can shake your hands. But students listen, and then they take a little brain break. You can also do a simple arm and legs stretch and you can do it standing or sitting down. Okay, so everyone, you've had a long day, right? Why don't you stretch your arms up? Okay, and lean to the right and lean to the left. Ah, doesn't that feel good? Okay, even we need a little bit of a break to stretch out sometimes. So all of you teachers out there work really hard. So take a moment for yourself as well. Okay, how about a breathing break? Maybe we need to calm down. Okay, so everyone, just close your eyes for a second. And I'd like you to take a deep breath in. Okay, take a deep breath in. And now release your breath. Let's do another one. Take a deep breath in. And release your breath. Wow, it only takes a few seconds, but doesn't that feel good? All right. So breathing break. You might take three or five breaths in and release the breath. And sometimes that's really helpful to relieve stress. Take a break before moving on to the next activity. It'll help your students then refocus on the new activity. Okay, you can also do something funny just to get them laughing if they seem stressed. Okay, so you could do the nosy ear, which is you get your left hand to touch your right earlobe. And then you get your right hand to touch the tip of your nose. Okay, and then you switch, and then you switch, <laughs> and then you oop, switch. Okay, <laughs> it's not so easy. It's like the 
tap your head and, and rub your tummy. You have to concentrate, but it gets your mind off of the stress of uh, sometimes learning something new. Okay. And of course, playing music. So you could play some soothing music to calm students after a lively activity. Or maybe you do just a quick one minute dance party where you play a song for one minute and let students dance to get the energy out. All right. I prepared a little song for you. That might be fun. Just for a few seconds, maybe. And play the whole song, obviously. But was that kind of fun to do a little dance party? I hope so. <laughs> okay, so the idea is a brain break. And I hope you found those ideas helpful. Another thing that I know that we talked about in the, uh, the VMOOC for TEYL is attention getters, right? So sometimes you do need to use things like a bell or even like a whistle, I have my train whistle, to get the attention of your students. Or sometimes teachers do lights out or a clap a rhythm and then students have to repeat. So these are good ideas for attention getters and you probably wanna use them or establish them with your young learners. But I also want to encourage you to use attention getters that also help practice more English in the classroom because that's what your students are there for. So a very commonly used call and response. So if you wanna get their attention, right? Teachers might say, one, two, three, eyes on me. And then students respond, one, two, eyes on you, and then have to look at the teacher. Okay, so that's a good attention getter routine. I also love to have other call and responses that are fun. So before you start an activity, you might say, ready to rock? And then your students can answer, ready to roll. Okay, let's try that once. Ready to rock? Ready to roll. Excellent. Or you can use the call and response. When I say blank, you say blank. And you can put in any two words, okay? So in my example here, I say, when I say ready, you say go, ready, go, ready, go. Okay, you could put anything in there. Like I love the peanut butter and jelly song. So I might say, when I say peanut, you say butter, peanut, butter, peanut, butter. Okay, so you get the idea. You can put in vocabulary words you're learning for the week. You could use, um, ask your students to say what words you want to do for the call and response and use the word that they want to use in English. It's up to you and it's very flexible. Another routine that I think is um, really helpful is to use hand signals. Now, this is because... Um, you don't want your students, every time you ask a question, to call out the answers all at once. Or you don't want to have uh, one or two students who are always calling out the correct answer. Then the other students don't get a chance to think about it and formulate their own response. Okay. So you can, of course, um, have students raise their hands, right? That's typical. But you can also establish some uh, hand signals, like if they have an answer, right, then they can use this closed fist. I have an answer. By the way, this shows like a American Sign Language A. I have an answer. Or if they have a question, it can be like this, right? Or if somebody else is answering and they have the same answer, they could say me too. Now, what is the use of this? Well, if students aren't all calling out, you can scan the room and see who has an answer, who has a question, maybe who agrees with something without everyone just speaking all at once and creating chaos. So this is a way, a nice classroom management routine that can be really helpful. Sometimes you can also use sign language. Now, 
this is American Sign Language. And so that this is an A, and this is a B, C, D, which kind of looks like a D, and an E, kind of looks like an E. Okay, so just raise your hand and try to do it with me. A, okay, that's like an A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so what is the use of this hand signal? Again, this is so all the students get a chance to give an answer, right? They don't have to be embarrassed for you to call on them if they have the wrong answer, but you can see who understands, maybe who needs some help, and then you can call on a person who has a correct answer, but it gives everyone the chance to think and find an answer before someone just calls it out and gives it away. All right, so let's practice. Let's say you have a story and you want to do a comprehension check. Okay, let's try it. So I'm going to show you a clip of a video and then I'm going to ask a question and we're going to use the hand signals. Here we go. Little Frog looks up. He sees Monkey in a tree. Monkey says, look at me. I can swing through the trees. Can you swing too? Little Frog says, no, I can't swing through the trees. Okay, so then I want to ask, is Little Frog happy, okay, A, happy, B, sad, C, angry, or D, surprised? Okay, so I would then look to see students' answers, A, or B, or C, or D, and then I would call on students based on the hand signals that I see. So again, I might call on the student who has the correct answer, but then I can see what other students are thinking. It's not embarrassing for them, but then I can support the comprehension in the activity. All right. So how do you like the hand signals? Do you think that you can use it in your classroom? It's such a great way to be able to manage your classroom, manage the talking time for each student, but also get feedback, right? You're going to see if students understand or comprehending. You don't have to embarrass them. And then you can support all of your learners more effectively. All right. So, um, another way is to use a three-finger scale. So before starting activity, you might check in with students, right? So you can see here that they could say, okay, one finger is, I'm not ready at all. Okay, two fingers, I need more practice. Okay, or three fingers, I'm ready. Okay, so if you build this routine before starting to have you say, okay, are you ready? And someone says, I'm not ready at all. That means maybe you need to explain the instructions or demonstrate the instructions for the activity again. Okay, I need more practice or I'm ready. If everyone's saying I'm ready, you can get started with the activity, but they might be giving you feedback. They're not ready yet and either they need more instructions or they might need more practice. Okay, so again, good routines, helps you understand where your learners are, makes sure that they're getting the support that they need, and it'll help them to enjoy the learning process, feel supported, and will help you be more effective in your classroom. All right, now, the next set of practical activities are going to focus on having fun with photos. I love using photos. Um, a lot of the materials that I work with use photos uh, from National Geographic, as you've seen. But the idea is you can have a lot of fun with photos. Uh, place, you'll see that this image comes from Pixabay. Pixabay is a great resource because they have photos um, that don't have the copyright. It's like in the Creative Commons and you can um, use them freely. And so it's really helpful. 
So if you want to use photos, of course, you can use these kinds of visuals to make text comprehensible. I know teachers uh, do this all the time. You're going to use a picture card, right? So to teach an elephant, you show a picture of an elephant, right? To teach what a hippo is, you show a photo of a hippo. To teach what a kangaroo is, you use a photo of a kangaroo. That's great. But in addition, you can also use photography and focus on interpreting the visuals. Okay, so there's a difference here because now if I say I'm going to use a photo like this, there's a feeling in there, there's emotion in there, there's a story in there. And so we can use the photo to teach vocabulary, but we can also use it to connect to learners and to connect to stories that there are around the world. So take a look at this photo and what do you see? Is it just to teach vocabulary or is it to teach something else? So tell me, what do you see in this photo? I'm going to take a look at the chat box now. What do you see? So maybe, ah, okay. So you might say, I see a gorilla. But here you see, I see love and care. Okay. And so why do you think that? Ah, thank you. Love between animals. This photo is useful for teaching students and showing affection to animals. Yes. Okay. So, so you're saying love between animals or you see love and care. Why do you think that? Why do you think that? What do you see that makes you think that? Mm hmm. Okay, so maybe you might see, thank you, interaction, eye contact. Okay, their actions. Okay, you might notice that they're holding hands, but actually, does a gorilla have hands? The man is using his hands to hold the gorilla's arm because it looks like the gorilla is missing a hand. So now you know there's more to this story about who this gorilla is and maybe why the gorilla is in this park and being taken care of by this man. Aha, eye contact. Absolutely. There's eye contact between the man and the gorilla. And then you can see in the caption, orphan gorilla and keeper in a park in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So you can then have a discussion about, are you good to animals? And what do you do? Because the value is to be good to animals. Okay, so I wanted to just hammer in this point that yes, we can use photos to teach vocabulary, but what about using photos to build visual literacy too? Because again, I can teach you what a rhin rhinoceros is, right here, but I can also teach you what a rhinoceros is by also examining this video, or sorry, this photo. So if you see here, let's compare this photo. Wonderful, beautiful. I love the rhinoceros. But what about teaching the vocabulary using a photo like this, where there's something else about how the rhinoceros in this video lives and is interacting with others? Thank you. So I see here a comment about meaningful context. Yes. So it's teaching about um, uh, English, teaching what an animal is, but now we're putting it into a meaningful context, which can actually uh, give you the opportunity to communicate more with your learners. So um, 
One suggestion I have, practical activity is a visible thinking routine, which comes from Harvard Project Zero, where the routine is to encourage students to take a look at a photo or an object, right? And have this routine. What do I see? I see a monkey. I think the baby looks surprised. <laughs> I wonder... What is the mommy doing to the baby monkey? Okay, so you engage your students in this routine. I see, I think, I wonder. And you're trying to teach them to approach any photo, any video, any object using this visible thinking routine and be able to express what they think, see, and wonder. And so what do you think this image might be an introduction to? Aha! It's an introduction to a discussion about taking care of others. Sometimes others need your help. Be caring. And then the think pair share is how can we take care of others? So you see how we can use the photos to engage. All right. So let's now take a look at another example here. What do you see here? Let's try it again. Put into the chat box, I see and what you see, I think and what you think, and I wonder and what you wonder about this. I'd love to see in the chat box three sentences, I see, I think, I wonder. Aha, a famous picture. I see toys. Okay. What else do you see? And think and wonder. Mm, I wonder how they made it. Mm -hmm. I see toys. I think this looks like a famous picture. Mm -hmm. I see toys. Okay, so I, I see this. I see toys. I think this looks like a famous picture, and I wonder how they made it. All right. So actually, this is art by a woman named Jane Perkins, who uses found objects and recycles them into works of art. And so this is a famous uh, painting, a rendition of a famous painting by Van Gogh, Starry Night. And it gives the introduction to a unit about reduce, reuse, recycle. Isn't that wonderful? So it creates a sense of wonder, right? Uh, and you can see the little toys, even little Legos and other things, and it's being recycled into art. Okay, so you get the idea. I see, I think, I wonder, which is an excellent visible thinking routine that you can engage your young learners in with the photos or Anyway, videos or other objects you bring into the classroom. Now you can play games while you're trying to build these um, uh, visual literacy skills. Okay, so this is a guessing game. And I want to know, can you guess what this is? What is this a photo of? By the way, I, I'm focusing in on the photo and then I'm going to pull it out, and then pull it out again so you can see what it is. But what do you think this says? Is it a, ooh, is it a dinosaur? Is it larva? Is it coral? Fascinating. All right, I'm going to pull the photo out just a little bit. And now, what do you think it is? Aha, uh -huh. someone thinks it's a crocodile, a stone, an iguana. Is it the skin of an animal, a sea animal? Well, I'll tell you, it's a toad. <laughs> so, yeah, some of you are absolutely right. It's the skin of an animal. Okay, let's try another one. Do you like this? Can you guess what this is? Mm, a worm, a snake, a 
butterfly, a snake. Fascinating. A butterfly wing. Okay, a fly, bee, a leaf. Okay, I'm going to pull it out. And now, what do you think this is? Aha, uh -huh. thank you. I see the correct answer in many. It's a cicada. Okay, <laughs> excellent. So these, this is fun you can have with photos. Now, you can also play guessing games with your students, right? So here you guess the student. So you're going to focus on what a student likes. This student likes blank. This student has blank. And this student has blank. Okay, so I'll give you an example and they put photos in. Okay, now you with your young learners might collect them and set this up. So this student likes Legos and Minecraft. This student has two dogs. This student has one sister. Okay, and then after that, because in your class, your students should know something about each other, and then maybe they can guess. It's Finn, Lego, and Minecraft Master. Okay, you'll learn a little bit more about who Finn is, but these are my kids. Okay, so you can personalize it where the student can introduce themselves. I like Legos and Minecraft. I have two dogs. I have one sister. All right, so notice with, um, I'll go back, it's Finn, it's in the format of a meme, right? Typical meme format. So you can also encourage your students to meme it, okay? Use a photo, make a meme, right? Here are some funny ones. Hey girl, online teaching is hard, but you got this. <laughs> or, oh no, I'm not perfect. <laughs> All right, so these memes can be fun and also a great way to practice English. Here's one. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. <laughs> okay, so another way. And it's so easy to encourage your students to meme it. You could use an online meme maker. Okay, so here's some more about cicadas. But you can also just have them use a photo, okay, and then just put your text right there. And the typical uh, meme font is impact. So that's what I used here. I just took my own photo and I used impact to make the meme. So this is my meme. I said, you're on mute. <laughs> How many times have we said that to someone on Zoom? Okay, you can also even make the meme uh, something that has a recorded speech to it using something like Chatterpix, where you can put in a photo and then make a mouth like this. I said you're on mute. Okay. <laughs> so if you use Chatterpix, you could just stick it in there, stick your photo like I did, draw a line with the mouth and record yourself. All right. Here's another meme. You can put your text here. What text would you put there? This is my dog, Sherlock, at the vet. <laughs> and you could put text there to make a cute meme. I think your students would love to do this with their pets as well. Okay, so mine is, I can hear you now. <laughs> okay, so uh, meme it. Great way to practice language. Great way to use photos. Another thing that you can do is to you make your own stories. Okay. And so um, this is a story that I made using photos that were on my phone. And so uh, I'm going to read you the story, but I encourage you, if you're like me, you have like thousands of photos on your smartphone. Why not use them to create a story? or use those photos to engage your young learners. Okay, so these are photos from my phone and I made a story called The Story of Sherlock. And that's Sherlock, he's my baby. Okay, here we go, The Story of Sherlock. Once upon a time, 
there was a puppy named Sherlock. His mommy loved him very much. They worked together. They played together. Then one day, his mommy got married. Now he was part of a family. The children loved him, and he loved the children. But one day, the family adopted another puppy. Her name was Penelope. Sherlock was not very excited about this new puppy. Penelope loved Sherlock, but Sherlock did not like the new puppy. She kept following him around. She took up all his space. <sighs> Then one day, Penelope wanted to play. Sherlock got angry. They fought and fought until Sherlock realized this was fun. And now they are best friends. And that is the story of Sherlock and Penelope. Do you like my story? Okay, so this is something you can do too. By looking into your photos and finding ways to engage your young learners through story. So think about it. What story can you create with the photos you have? I really encourage you to try. And I'm sure your students are going to love it. Okay. Now, last thing is I really want to encourage creativity. And so, You can use so many different ways. Like, for example, your students can make videos too. Here's an example from ChatterPix that I showed you before that I made, but your students can make something too, even from their drawings. I, a frog is a amphibian. It, it, it is covered with skin. A frog eats bugs. Frogs live in ground. I like that frogs can be poisonous. An iguana is a reptile. It is covered with scaly skin. An iguana eats plants. An iguanas live in hot places. I like iguanas. Okay, so it's so easy to use ChatterPix. I don't have time to demonstrate it, but if you go to the app, you'll see you can use any photo that you take, draw a mouth, and record yourself speaking. Okay, so the link is there. There's a QR code, um, and I hope that you will enjoy using it. All right, now you can also encourage students to create a book using Book Creator. So, I'm going to stop sharing just for a moment so I can show you how it's so easy to put your book, your story, onto Book Creator. All right, so here is a story of Sherlock. You can put the image and the text up plus record a voice. The story of Sherlock. Once upon a time, there was a puppy named Sherlock. His mommy loved him very much. They worked together. They played together. All right. Now, since I just told you the story, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I did want to show you, you can also incorporate other media. So when I got to this point, they fought and fought until Sherlock realized this was fun. And here's a video. And now they are best friends. All right. So how do you like the use of Book Creator? It really makes the story come alive. So you can be even more creative with your students. Okay, I hope these ideas are useful to you. 
Now, give me a moment. I'm going to reshare my screen. Oh, we're getting toward the end, but I did want to encourage you to also use poetry to encourage your students to be creative, right? One of the ways that's really fun is to use a shape poem. So see here, the shape is a ball. Okay, so what is it? It's a ball and it's a poem. It's a poem shaped like a ball. <laughs> so you can see here you start out, I want a ball. I don't want a bike. I want a ball, a red ball. I don't want a drum or a kite. I want a ball, please. A red ball. Notice simple language that the students are using, right? That they've learned for this unit and that they can create a poem. So even older learners can really enjoy making a poem. This is obviously a shape poem of a flower. And it starts here at rose petals, pink, red, and yellow, blooming, colorful, sweet smelling tulips and daisies, stem, petals, and leaves and shades of green, multicolored wonders of my garden and spring amaze. All right. How do you like that? Now, from one of my books, Teaching Young Learners English, I created this shape poem, which I think is simple, but it's also fun. So it starts on the left. First, I climb up slowly. Then I slide down fast. <laughs> All right. So many ways to be able to encourage your young learners to be creative and to express themselves. So another thing that can help them express themselves, maybe little paper bag puppets, right? You can recycle. And here is, here is mine, where you even have a little mouth and tongue in it. And you can introduce your puppet. You can even do a dialogue and have a conversation with the puppet. And uh, it's a way for students to be creative and also practice some more language. So in this case, I could say, oh, this is my friend, Ilsa. She's so beautiful. Mm, she's worried today because she's new and she didn't make friends at school yet. Can you say hi to her and say hi? Hi, be my friend. All right. So these are all ideas to encourage creativity and also tap into students' uh, social interaction to build more authentic and meaningful opportunities for communication. All right. So those are my practical activities for young learners, right? I gave you lots of activities to establish routines, to have fun with photos, and to encourage creativity. But the idea in all of my activities is to really reach the heart of your young learners and to make sure they know you love them, you support them, that you care about how they're feeling, you care about who they are, and that connection is really going to be the most important in order to be effective teaching English to young learners. And so I leave you with a couple of last thoughts that I like to express because I think they're so important. So this one from Plato, do not train children to learning by force and harshness, but direct them to it by what amuses their minds so that you may be better able to discover with accuracy the peculiar bent of the genius of each. So it isn't just about making your classroom fun. No, you're amusing their minds in order to make them feel more comfortable, in order to make them feel that the learning environment is safe and is supportive of them. Then you can really get to see that peculiar bent of the genius of each. If they feel comfortable and supported by you, then their personalities will come out. And then you'll know even better how to connect with them and how to connect them to what they're learning in the classroom. And always remember that 
every student can learn, just not on the same day or the same way. Always remember, every student can learn. You shouldn't have favorites in your classroom. You should be focused on every student and how to help them learn. If you want to continue to learn more, please feel free to join this uh, TEYL Facebook group because as teachers, right? You're a professional, you wanna keep learning. You're great at it because you keep learning and you have that passion because you love teaching children. And most of all, the world needs you. So everyone, you were wonderful. You were great. See you next class and don't be late. Thank you so much. This is the end of my presentation and I really appreciate all of your participation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shin. And uh, I really think that was a really inspiring uh, session for all of us. And um, I, I think that that's very useful for all of you guys too. So, um, and this also brings us to the closing ceremony.